Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale German Dicker Max tank destroyer. Now unlike many of the other smaller scale builds that are showcased on the ECA channel in which those builds are built for private commission and belong to a private collector, the model that you see here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these model showcase videos, I often take on commission build projects from models ranging from 135th scale all the way up to 1 6th scale. As for availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Now the model itself is built mostly out of the box, however it does feature several aftermarket additions and changes that have been made to the stock kit. We'll be going over these additions as well as reviewing the base starter kit in this video. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around the model. And this vehicle here is the 10.5 centimeter KPZ SFL 4A, also known as the Dicker Max. The Dicker Max is a very interesting vehicle in that, first and foremost, its name alone is probably the strangest name I've ever seen given to a military vehicle. The name itself sounds something more along the lines of a porn star rather than something designed to be a assault gun or a tank destroyer. The vehicle itself dates back to the late 1930s and the early 1940s. The vehicle was intended to be used against bunkers and heavy fortified fortifications. The vehicle was originally intended to be that of a self-propelled gun or an assault gun, in which the vehicle would have a very large and powerful gun on a motorized chassis. The concept was to have the gun be so powerful that it will give you nice standoff range where you can shell the heavily armored fortification, however you will still be out of range for return fire. Because of this the armored protection on the Dicker Max was very minimal. Because of the self-propelled gun roll that the vehicle was designed for, the designers went ahead and incorporated a large casemate design. This allowed the gun to have very limited transverse capabilities compared to a vehicle with a turret. But because this is not going to be engaging other enemy tanks on a one-to-one -one, head to head basis the casemate design was deemed to be adequate. This is also true for several of the other vehicles that had the same intended role. Such vehicles as the Bison comes to mind. One of the core concepts that this vehicle was developed was to deal with the French Maginot Line. As we know, the French had a series of very powerful and heavily armored bunkers and fortifications along the French and German border that protected France from any sort of German invasion, obviously from the French experience during World War I. In addition to being developed to fight on the Maginot Line, the vehicle was also built with the concept of Blitzkrieg in mind. This is evident with the many of the design cues that went into the Dicker Max. For the base chassis, the Panzerkampfwagen Alf E was utilized. At this time, this vehicle was brand new and was just starting to come off of the production lines and into service. The Panzer IV chassis, however, had to go under significant modifications in order to get it up to the specs for that of the assault gun. On the prototype vehicles that were actually produced, the engine that would have been utilized on the Panzer IV, the V12 Maybach HL120, was not utilized. In place, a lighter inline-6 Maybach HL66P engine was used in its place. The purpose for using the lighter engine had to do with the overall lighter weight of the Dicker Max compared to the standard Panzer IV tank. The combination of the lighter weight engine compared with the overall lighter weight of the vehicle as a whole, the Dicker Max would have been able to hit a top speed of 17 miles an hour. Keep in mind for the late 1930s, early 1940s time frame, this was definitely a little bit above average compared to the other vehicles of the period. For the tank's main armament, a 10.5 centimeter Schwerkanon Aktsein howitzer was utilized. This howitzer had the ability to fire a 105mm shell at around 6 rounds a minute. 
its effective range was about 19 kilometers or roughly 12 miles. By early 1941, two prototypes were ordered and were built by Krupp. There were only ever two examples of the Dicker Max that were ever made. By the time the two pilot models were built, the fall of France had already been completed and the Maginot Line was no longer a threat. However, at this time, Germany started turning its attention towards the east in preparation for invading Russia. The two examples of the Dicker Max were to see action on the Eastern Front. Once deployed to the east, in addition to being utilized as an assault gun as originally intended, the vehicle was also being used as a tank destroyer as well. Shortly after the two vehicles were fielded, the feedback started coming back from the field. One of the vehicles regrettably had a catastrophic failure due to a faulty artillery shell and the entire vehicle was destroyed. The remainder of the feedback and service done on the Dicker Max was with the second prototype model. Some of the feedback that came from the field about this vehicle was that the armor protection was a little bit on the thin side. Also, some of the other problems had to do with that of the transverse of the gun. Because of the casemate, the transverse was very limited and this definitely came into effect when dealing with multiple targets, specifically trying to track tanks moving in a field. One of the other complaints was that due to the smaller engine, the vehicle was definitely significantly more underpowered when it came time to dealing with these threats on off-road conditions. Because of the limited transverse of the gun, the entire vehicle would have to be pivoted in order to get the target into, into range. Some of the other problems that were cited had to do with that of the steering brakes, which tended to wear out quicker on this vehicle since they were apparently under more stress than they were on the standard Panzer IV. Other than that, the engine transmission, however, from all reports that exist, don't seem to have any significant problems. The second vehicle did participate in several battles successfully up until the end of 1941. At that point there, the vehicle was sent back to Krupp for a quick refurbishment and upgrade. Once the vehicle was sent back to Russia, the vehicle then participated in a few more battles and one of the campaigns was Case Blue in the 1942 Summer Offensive. That vehicle was participating in that battle, however the records do not show of the vehicle being operational past that point in time. That was the last known recorded evidence of the Dicker Max in combat. One final factoid for this vehicle has to do again with the vehicle's name. The vehicle got the name Dicker Max as a nickname due to the shape and size of the vehicle's rear casemate. Dicker Max translates into Fat Max which is definitely why one can see how the name arose. And just like with a lot of other nicknames out there, sometimes really dumb nicknames tend to stick and unfortunately for this vehicle that's the case. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplied you with. And here's the model at the start of the project. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 135th scale plastic Dicker Max German World War II tank destroyer from Dragon. These kits were released by Dragon back in 2007 and are entirely comprised of new tooling. Now what's interesting to point out was that at this time, Dragon was kind of in a bit of a arms race and competition with another plastic model company by the name of Trumpeter. During this time, both Dragon and Trumpeter were both producing a lot of variants off the Panzer IV chassis and they were basically both mirroring each other doing the same kits. The Dicker Max was one of these kits that both companies were producing and both released at around the same time. Both Dragon and Trumpeter have good distribution networks and these kits here should be fairly easy to find anywhere from being, being lucky and snagging one in a local hobby shop all the way to online retailers such as Amazon or eBay. This particular kit here I actually purchased from a hobby shop in New York City 10 years ago when I was actually visiting the city. Model has been sitting in the stash for a number of years and it's about time I finally get to it. Starting with the model's graphic design, the graphic design that you see on the model here is that of your Dicker Max tank destroyer. 
and it's in a woodland scene, more than likely Eastern Europe, somewhere probably in Russia. We have here a BMW sidecar, as well as what appears to be a German SDKFZ251 half-track. The vehicle is decently rendered, and the scene is nicely composed. As for the artist, Dragon did not utilize their standard artist for the, this piece, which would typically be done by Vince or Ronald Volstead. As for the rest of the graphic design, it is typical for that of a Dragon 39th of 45 series, which would have the vehicle, and with that of the green labeling. Of course, this is kit number 6357. The rest of the graphic design shows the features that the kit has, which in this kit, particular kit is not just plastic, but also has parts made in photo etch as well as also in metal. Of course, I'll be getting to that when I crack open the box. As, the, as I continue, you can see more of the features of the CAD drawings. Now this kit does feature several options, which is also contemporary for these Dragon kits, as you, there's more than one variation of this kit to build, which is again a great value for that of the builder. On the back we have here some more features that the kit has. Cracking open the box takes us to the kit contents. At quick glance, you will notice that this vehicle has a ton of components. If you are looking for a very quick build or a build that's not very complex, this is definitely not going to be the kit for you and you might definitely want to look elsewhere. As for the tooling quality, it's typical Dragon, which utilizes that of typical Dragon gray type plastic. And the tooling is nicely molded and nicely rendered. There's not any flash or any other impurities to point out with the quality of the moldings. Now a lot of these runners has to do with the fact that this model is an open top fighting compartment type vehicle which lends itself to having a partial interior. By that you're going to have a lot of components to build as well as a lot of interior gun components that also need to be carefully assembled as well as there are a lot of very finely molded pieces which definitely need care exhibited by the builder. Here we have the one piece fighting compartment. Now what's nice about this is that Dragon actually went ahead and molded it with a very thin to scale type surfaces. This is a nice touch and is definitely one that Dragon built into this kit with a lot of care. The piece is well protected in this vacuum form plastic tub to prevent it from more likely getting squished and smashed during its unassembled point. Going down takes us to the interior detailing. As you see, typical for Dragon quality. Getting our way to this run here, which is that of the running gear. Now one nice feature is that the, that the wheels do not have their rubber tires molded in. The rubber tires are actually a separate piece that gets slipped over the wheel hub. This feature I've seen on the Dragon HVSS Sherman variants that they have produced in recent years. And it's the same concept with this type of tooling. This looks to be some more interior fighting compartment components. Digging down deeper takes us to a generic Panzer IV runner. More than likely a large number of these pieces will not be utilized on this build as this piece here just looks like a standard runner that Dragon supplies with all of their Panzer IV based vehicles which is definitely quite a lot. One nice feature is you could see if I could get into frame that of the diamond plate texturing on the vent side fenders. They are very finely molded and to scale which is definitely a testament to Dragon's type tooling as getting dots rendered this tiny is definitely a bit problematic for some companies or specifically for kits in the past as well. Some more interior detailing looks like some ammo racks of some sort. Here go the rubber tires.
and lots more pieces. These appear to be German AFV Pioneer tools, which is again a standard runner which Dragon supplies with many of their kits. More odds and ends. Part management on this build is definitely something that is going to need to be addressed by the builder as is easily can occur where you can lose components. This here is just some generic German field equipment, shovels, helmets, canteens, etc. This is like the final drive, as well as even the final drive gear, which is a very interesting detail that they put in, as well as interior detailing on the final drives. Very thorough. Kind of pointless, but again, if you're building a diorama, I guess this might be beneficial to you. This is not part of the kit. I'll go over that in a minute. Sprockets, rear idlers. Lower hull pan. Note the rivet detailing found on the lower chassis. Going down deeper takes us to this cardboard panel here with several other very fragile pieces. This is a type of feature that I've seen on many Dragon kits in the past where they put a lot of their specialty pieces on the special type cardboard. We have here some single piece molded rear idler wheels which is actually very impressive that they were able to mold it in one fully assembled piece. We have some photo etch components and aluminum barrel, clear plastic fittings, water slide decals, and some more other little bits of components to be added. Getting down to the bottom takes us to the instructions. Like I said before, there's going to be a lot of components which are not going to be used on this build, which again were for a basic standard Panzer IV. As for the quality of the instructions, again they look to be standard Dragon with that of their CAD drawings. And in the past I've had some pretty decent results with these instructions and of course if there's any sort of anomalies or hiccups of course I'll mention them in the finished portion of the tank's video. And looks like some more documentation and literature on their kit and the Dicker Max as a whole. Make for an interesting read. There's also a metal cable that's applied in the in the cardboard cutout and here go the eyelets which connect to it. This is a standard piece I've seen on, on a few other Dragon German kits in the past. Now, getting down to the last thing to discuss is that of the tank's track. Dragon on this kit here utilize that of their magic track. Magic track is another form of static link and length type track which as we all know from my videos are absolutely despised by myself and like I frequent, frequently say are a utmost cancer on the armor modeling community and will not be utilized for this build. In its place I'll be utilizing this set here of vinyl tracks. The vinyl tracks that I have here are were originally from Italery. Now I know a lot of people are going to shudder and think that's blasphemous for me even attempting to use anything from Italery on a fine kit such as, such as a dragon. However, these tracks here are definitely not as bad as people like to give them credit for. The tracks are nice and flexible. They have some adequate molded in interior and exterior type detailing and should match well and time well with the dragon sprockets and pieces. As for these tracks here, they were acquired in a lot that I purchased off of eBay about 15 or so years ago and have been sitting waiting for a build since then. Now if there are any issues with these tracks, of course I will be discussing them when I review the suspension and running gear section of the model shortly after this scene here, so stay tuned for that. Starting with the model suspension, all the suspension components that you see here, with the exception of the track, are stocked with the original kit and were assembled out of box. The kit's suspension does assemble quite well, however it is important to point out that the pieces are so finely detailed that each suspension bogey arm set consists of several smaller components that need to be assembled into sub-assemblies prior to mounting onto the tank. 
Once everything is said and done, however, the suspension does assemble in a very nice and detailed manner. While on the suspension, this takes us to the row wheels. The row wheels that you see on the model have that feature like I showcased earlier where the rubber tires are separate castings from that of the wheel rims themselves. This is a feature that is seen on several other more contemporary and recent releases from Armor Kits from Dragon. This bit of detailing does make building the model a little bit easier in that when it comes time for putting and painting on the tires, you don't have to paint them while on the rim, as which is customary on other 135th scale tanks on the market. With the pieces being separate, you can actually build and paint the wheels separately, paint the rubber tires and weather the rubber tires separately, and then just slip them on just before installation to the vehicle, which is exactly how I did it on this model. Moving from the row wheels takes us to the rear idler wheels. The idler wheels on this model here are the ones with the piece of photo etch that was supplied with the kit. Now the kit does give you two options for use of the rear idler wheel. One version is just all plastic and the other uses the PE. The all plastic one I simply put in my spare parts bin for use for another day. Um, possibly another build. As for the PE, it went, it went together very easily and it made it perfectly with that of the plastic components which were supplied with the kit. Overall the piece was very nicely engineered. Now as for the idler wheel itself, this is actually on an adjustable idler mount which is a very nice feature supplied with the kit. This made the mounting of the track in a very realistic manner in that you need to fine tune and adjust the track tension just prior to the installation. Now as for the component, the idler mount itself has a kind of a hex appearance to it so that it doesn't slide when it comes time to adjusting your track tension. This is a nice feature however I found that the tolerances are very very tight between the swing arm and that of the idler mount itself. While doing the build with a small dremel bit I went and a pin vise I went ahead and just removed a slight bit amount of material on the hole found in the idler mount just so that the idler can then slip on in without the use of any sort of pressure which can be problematic specifically once the tank is fully built as you don't want to break anything. From the rear idler now takes us to the return rollers. Now there were two options that were supplied with the kit. However, the versions that you see here were the ones that were recommended on the instruction sheet and I just simply use them as is with no mods necessary or needed. Both the, the rubber tires as well as the return rollers are nicely detailed with the actual tire information info which is molded in which at this scale is very impressive. And moving forward now takes us to the main drive sprockets. These were assembled completely out of box with no mods needed. One little feature that this kit has that I found to be very interesting but also a pretty useless bit of detailing has to do with that of the final drive. The final drive on this model here actually is detailed with its interior detailing in that you have the, the final drive inner casing detail along with the actual reduction gears themselves. This is a very interesting bit of detailing but again is something that is completely useless once you're building the model in a completed form. Now obviously something like this would be best suited for someone who's building a diorama or a maintenance type scene and of course if you want to have the piece off of the tank and you could have a mechanic working on said components. I believe this same detailing has also been done on the Trumpeter Panzer IV series as well, but this kit specifically has this bit of useless but cool detailing nonetheless. Moving from the sprocket now takes us to that of the tank's Caterpillar tracks. Now like what was showcased earlier in the unboxing portion, the track that's applied with this kit here is the individual Lincoln length. As we all know, my hatred for this material is legendary and of course is definitely not going to be used for this model. Now, in its place, I was originally going to utilize a set of one-piece vinyl tracks from Metallery. In fact, I have the runner right here. Now, this, while working on the tank, I shortly discovered that this track here is not going to be suitable for the Dicker Max. The reason for which has to do with the type of track that this tank here would be patterned for. This being a very early pattern of Panzer IV, the tracks were actually thinner on these vehicles compared to the later renditions of the Panzer IV series. Now the track that's applied with the Italeri kits are that of the later pattern with the wider track. If I compare the sprocket widths, here you can definitely see 
how this plays into effect. Here is the Italeri track on the left, and the thinner track for the Dicker Max and the early pattern Panzer IVs on the right. Now, because the Italeri tracks were not going to be suitable for this build here, I need to find another alternative for the tracks. As like I said before, there's, it's a cold day in hell before you'll see me use individual Lincoln Lane tracks on any one of my builds. Now, in place of the stock track and in lieu of using the Italeri track, I went ahead and acquired a set of workable track links from Fruly Model. I've used several of the Fruly Model tracks on other builds in the past, and like always, they are highly recommended. They are all made in a cast metal alloy and actually pinned together with that of a little bit of wire, which is used as the pins. The track is superbly detailed and has all of its little intricate moldings present on each of the metal castings. The guide horns are also hollow, which is, which is just like the actual vehicle it represents. Now, as you can see from here, the timing of the Fruly links around the stock Dragon Sprocket is absolutely perfect. There is no hiccups or any sort of blemishes to discuss when it comes time for fitting these tracks onto this tank. It's almost as if it's designed for it from the get-go. Now, as for the tracks, this is the item number is ALT02. They supply you with a two bags containing all of the track links required in order to assemble the tank. Here go the track links still in their bag that were just spares. Now, on these links here, because of the way they are casted, the hole that is molded into the hinge sections, which would be for use of the wire, tends to be slightly smaller than the wire which is needed to hinge everything together. Now, to open this up, I use a very small Dremel bit on a pin vise, and I, on each link, I simply just enlarge the holes, cleaning them out. Once this is done, the pieces just simply hinge together, and it gives me the length of track that you see here. Now, like I mentioned before, the idler mount is adjustable on the kit, which came into effect when it came time for installing that of the track. I simply assembled the track, lined everything up, and then added the track tension and set the track tension with some super glue on the idler wheel, which gave me the complete look that you see here. Now, the set from Fruly does give you more than enough track lengths in order to complete one full build like you see here. And as you can see from the bag, there's still plenty of track lengths remaining. This is a very good thing specifically because when it comes time to fitting the track links and making sure that the holes are nice and enlarged, you will have a couple occasions where the track link will get ruined while you're doing the procedure for one reason or another. It's not a problem again as you do have an ample amount of track links to work with. Now even though the Fruly links are as recommended as they are, there are some downsides to using this set. The first downside is the cost of the actual links. The links themselves run anywhere between 35 to 40 US dollars and addition to the already similar price of the kit itself can inflate the tank to exceed some modelers budgets. And it is something to keep in mind when starting with something like a kit with individual links that you want to swap out. Another potential downside is the actual material that the tracks are made in. The tracks are made out of white metal and they are a lead based alloy. This can definitely cause problems for anyone who builds models on a surface such as their kitchen table or in their workroom, specifically if the person does have small children around. These tracks need to definitely be kept away from small children and you have to constantly remember to wipe down and clean your workspace, your tools, and of course not to mention your hands in order just to prevent any sort of lead contamination. However, having said that, I cannot recommend these tracks enough for this build. Another positive side that these tracks do have is that due to their material, they have a nice little weight to them. Because of this weight, the this transfers into the tank suspension and it actually gives the tank a nice bit of heft to it which is definitely something that comes to play specifically for diorama use. Now 
In addition to Fully Modeled, there's another vendor on the aftermarket scene that has replacement tracks which would be suitable for this kit here. That company is Master Club, and their links can be found on a via a quick Google search. Their track links, just like the Frulies, are made out of a white metal cast alloy. I'm not certain offhand, however, if they are using the same or similar type of lead-based alloy. I do know that the one difference between the tracks is that on the Frulies you have a piece of wire that gets used for that of the track link pin, and on the Master Clubs the track link pins are actually small little resin casted pieces that get glued into place. I've yet to use anything from Master Club, so I can't really recommend one over the other. But I will say that from looking at both sets, each of them are perfectly suffice for a build like this one here. Moving from the track now takes us to the remainder of the exterior detailing. Starting with the rear hull, it's a very simple type setup. Here we have a spare tire, which is centrally mounted here on this air duct. Now all the details that you see here are all kits applied in with no mods needed. It does bring point though to refer to the rear convoy light. The no tech light that you see here is supplied with the kit and it's so nicely detailed that they give you two options to display the part. Just like on the real unit, there's a small little hinged little plate over here that you can mold it or model it in the up section, revealing the two other lights which are shown on the bottom. Here I have it in blackout mode and as you can see the lights are painted with a green coloring as per the real vehicle. On the rear section here we have a small little reflector. This is a piece of photo etch which is supplied with a kit that gets simply removed and mounted to its appropriate location. On the opposite side we have another rear convoy or tail light and we have here the top lens painted in red and the bottom painted in amber which is as I've seen it on a few surviving examples of these tail lights that, are, that exist today. Moving along the sides takes us to the tank's Pioneer tools. All the equipment that you see here is basically that from a Panzer IV pattern vehicle. The kit does supply you with an ample amount of tools for use on this model, most of which however will simply not be used and are relegated to the spare parts bin, which is basically part and parts for a more modern generation Dragon kit. One thing to point out is the little step ladder that we have here on the side. This is actually a piece of photo etch that is bent to shape and there's a small little plastic tube section which is supplied with the kit that gets mounted into its little section. The piece does assemble quite easily but is one that you have to take your time with as you can easily over bend it and if you don't have the right pliers on hand will definitely make the job a little bit more difficult. Once it's mounted in place however the piece is good to go. The remainder of the tools that you see here are all plastic components. When it comes to the front, this is where you have some more photo etch to contend with. The kit does have the track link mounts with the use of photo etch brackets. These pieces are somewhat complex compared to some of the other photo etch kits that are supplied with models on the market, but is again one that if you take your time and if you use the right adhesives, you can easily get them together. This is one of the sections over here, which is why I can't really recommend this model for a real beginner. Now on the opposite side, there is a, another set of track links, and they are slightly off-centered, which is as per the kit instructions. Now moving from the track links now takes to the bow headlights. The headlights that you see on this model here are comprised of both clear plastic and photo etch. The clear plastic components are definitely something that Dragon has been incorporating more and more with their 135th scale models and is definitely a feature that I enjoy. As for how to mount them and paint them on the model, the way these pieces are assembled is as per the instructions and then they get mounted to the model of course during its construction phase. Then the model is fully painted. Now of course after the tank gets fully painted you are going to have some overspray on these parts on the headlights. To get the paint off really depends on whether the tank is painted with acrylic or enamel. If the tank is painted with acrylic with a small paintbrush, I take a dab of rubbing alcohol and brush it over the paint covered lenses. The same thing is done with turpentine or paint thinner if the tank is painted with enamels. After a few dabs, the paint that is on the lenses or the section that I want to be removed becomes soft and then I could just simply just wipe it away thus leaving for the exposed clear plastic section that we have here and it does leave for a very nice realistic look. The same thing was also done for that of the clear visor that is showcased on the driver's section. 
Moving from the bow headlights now takes us to that of the Miles Travelock. Now the Travelock that you see here is totally stock and no mods were made to it. The Travelock does have some options in which you can display it. The way you see on this model here is in the in the stowed way in which the tank would be being ready to fire or you can have it in the deployed position where the gun can rest inside of the travel lock itself. Now amongst those two options there are also two more options for that of the restraint section found here on the top of the travel lock. On the model here it's depicted as that of a cog chain similar to which that is found on a panther. Now you can have it either in the closed state or in the open state in which the piece is, is molded in a slightly different manner. This is totally up to the, at the discretion of the builder. Moving from the travel lock now takes it to the other section of the model. Here you can see that of the spare tracks like I mentioned before, the jack block, as well as the actual jack. The jack itself is supplied with the model and just like with the spare track links does give you two photo etch sections for that of the actual clamps. Just like with the track links the clamps can be a little difficult for a beginner to master or someone who just doesn't have a good set of very fine pliers. It's another one of those features where if you take your time and let glues dry you'll be able to fully flesh out these two components. Moving back from the jack now takes us to the tank's exhaust, which is this side section here and is quite typical for that of a exhaust manifold found on vehicles of this era. Moving from the side detailing now takes us to the two front visors. Now this is one section of the model which gave me a little bit of confusion. On the Dicker Max, on one side we have the driver and on the other side we have another bow section for some other crew member. Now. What's interesting is that the Dicker Max utilizes two Panzer IV pattern front visors, which makes perfect sense. However, on the model here, this section is totally empty or lacking any sort of detailing on the inside. I do not know if this was done by design from the Dragon Kit or if this was just a mistake. I also can't tell you if the Trumpeter version of the Dicker Max has this component with the other visor. As for the visor on the driver's side, this is a nicely detailed piece and it's comprised of three pieces. We have here a clear vision block, the main visor casing, as well as the visor shield. All three of these components are molded separately and get glued on and once assembled do make for a nicely detailed component. Now on this build here, as for the visor block, just about before I was about to install it to the piece, the tweezer decided to fling the visor off and the piece landed in Lost Partia and was there's no trace or sight of it ever since. Rather than getting, well in addition to getting pretty pissed off, I went ahead and decided I had to fabricate a new one. The piece was fabricated out of a, out of a block of resin which was shaped and carved to the exact same dimensions and pattern as the original Dragon component. To do this I utilized the instructions as well as pictures of the real Panzer IV visor and also some 135th scale Panzer IVs I had on hand just to use it for as a reference point. Once the piece was completed it was mounted in place and the piece looks identical to that of the Dragon counterpart. In fact I would be hard pressed to find out if anyone took a look at this model here and were able to see that this piece was a scratch built fabricated component as opposed to the original kit supplied piece. While on the front driver section we have here on the side a small armored visor. One quick tip to point out is with a paintbrush with a very thin bristle take a little swipe of gloss black and simply paint the inner section here of the molded in crease line. This replicates that of the Panzer glass which is found on the real visor. It's a quick little tidbit but is one that helps bring the model up from just leaving it with the piece being painted with the color of the vehicle. Moving from the visor now takes us to the casemate. Now if we notice here on the front section of the casemate I went ahead and added some sculpted weld beads. The weld beads are found on the side, along the top, and along the front sections here. The reason for this bit of detailing is one it adds detailing to the model but another purpose for it has to do with the way the model assembles. You will have some seam work in these locations over here. By turning the seams into weld beads this covers up the sections that would be exposed but it also gives a little bit of extra detailing to the model. 
The remainder of the casemate went together fairly easily. I will point out though that on this section here, there was a small little gap to contend with that was just not present on the opposite side. The gap was simply removed with a little bit of putty work and everything was then sanded to the flush, seamless appearance that you see here. Moving on from the casemate now takes to the interior portion of the model. Now being an open top vehicle, there is some fighting compartment detailing that is present on this build. Now the detailing for the interior only consists of the fighting compartment and the other interior detailing such as an engine or a driver's compartment is just not present and is also not visible once the model is built in the configuration that you see it here. Having said that, all of the hatches that are found on the model are separate pieces that get glued and it's your option to either mount them in the closed or open states. So if anyone is inclined to scratch build their own interior, they are at liberty to do so. Starting with the fighting compartment detailing, of course, takes us to that of the main gun. The main gun is that of the 105 centimeter Canon 18 and the model is very intricately designed. The detailing is all present with that of its crank wheels as well as its optical sights, as well as all the other recuperators and breech block detailing, which one would expect to find on an artillery piece such as this one. Now, the model is assembled, and when it gets built, the gun can go up and down, and there is some light transversing to it as well. As you can see, the Optic is connected to everything and pivots along with the remainder of the gun carriage. Now this was actually a happy accident as when I was building the kit, from the way the gun mounts into the casemate, it would be best done by gluing everything in place. And the gun was going to be static in its transverse and just have its elevation present. However, once everything was said and done, there was a small little, I guess, knock on the gun barrel during the installation of the of the mantlet and this knocked the glue out in just the right location and allowed the gun to now freely pivot left and right. Now as you can see the barrel is tends to be a bit front heavy which is something to be expected on German tanks specifically because of the gun muzzle brake. Another reason why the front of the barrel tends to be heavier is that on this particular build this model does feature an aluminum gun barrel. The kit supplies you with two options. You have a standard plastic barrel, which the plastic barrel itself is nothing to scoff at. It's a nice one-piece tooling and can be easily used without any problems. However, in addition to that, the kit also supplies you with a very nicely done CNC aluminum barrel. On this model here, of course, I went with the aluminum barrel because why not? And it's definitely one that just mounts directly to the kit without a whole lot of problems. The only modification to make has to do with the section on the receiver that the barrel plugs into. There is a small little notch and key found on the receiver which is designed for that of the plastic barrel. The plastic barrel goes into this notch and keeps everything in line. This little key notch is absent on the aluminum piece and in order to install the aluminum barrel all you have to do is with a small little knife is to clip away at that little notch just deleting it. Once that notch is deleted, the barrel can simply get mounted in place with no issues. As for the remainder of the interior, this is one very interesting vehicle in the fact that it has these two air ducts that are found on the top of the roof. These air ducts have actual ductwork that funnels onto the sides of the casemate and it actually accumulates in the center portion of the vehicle. This is Definitely a first for me as I've never seen another type of vehicle with this type of a system. The only other vehicle that comes similar to this is either a Nashorn or a Hummel, which utilize a vent type system found on the sides of the casemate, which would suck air in and down into the engine compartment. On the Dicker Max, apparently, this is done via these two slack grills found on the top of the casemate. In addition to that, the model does have a nicely detailed radio. The radio itself is the stock unit. I simply went ahead and painted all of these small little integrally molded in knobs and gauges, which once everything is done, greatly helps the look of the piece compared to just leaving it totally stock. On the sides here, if I can just keep this gun up. Oh, by the way, the gun does stay tend to lock into its up position. However, while maneuvering it around for the video, it's knocking it loose. But it's definitely something that stays in place when no one's messing with the model. As for the... Other interior detailing we have here, the ammunition racks. One holds that of the 
ammunition propellant case and the other one that of the projectiles. Now what's interesting is that on the model these pieces are actually modeled so you could display them either in the open or closed state. On this model here I just went ahead and made them all buttoned up. But again this is at the discretion of the builder who can easily make it either one or the other. There are some other interior detailing present such as basic German field gear. We have here some gas masks as well as a canteen. What's nice about these components is that Dragon actually has small little photo etch straps which would be used to simulate the leather or canvas type webbing straps that hold everything to their mounts which would be built into the side armor plate of the model. It's a nice feature and then once added gives the interior of the model a little bit of life. On the back wall here we have some potato mashers. We have two racks of which. These again all stock with the kit and are very nicely detailed with their little clip detailings all present. If you just take your time and paint everything appropriately, they really helps make the components pop. On the back here we have some gun cleaning staves as well as other cleaning staves on the rear. And there's also some other crew amenities such as a oiler as well as a map case. These are all supplied with the kit and just get mounted in the locations that are requested on the instructions. While on the roof now takes us to the antenna base. The antenna base on the model is the kit supplied unit and replicates that of your standard German World War II antenna base, which entails that of a rubber bottom section and a small little fitting made from brass. Now if you notice the piece is solid and I, in, in order to fit on an antenna I would have to drill this out. Regrettably this piece is so tiny that trying to drill it out you're just going to cause nothing but problems. So rather than trying to destroy this piece I just simply left it with the antenna omitted, which is something that is perfectly adequate. Now if anyone does want to have the antenna present, I recommend replacing and cutting away the stock antenna base and replacing it with one of the metal aftermarket ones on the market from companies like Aber or RB Model. There are small German antenna bases made from CNC brass that would easily mount to the section here and give you that replacement detailing without any of the fuss and mess of trying to drill this one out. Also on top we have here a small little periscope. This periscope here is supplied with the kit and just like with a few other components it's made from clear plastic. This is a nice addition and specifically with this media. The part can be mounted in the deployed state like I have here or you can have this hatch in the button up position and sealed off. Now regrettably another optic that was supplied unfortunately is missing is that of the German telescoping V-shaped binocular set which would be on this hinged little system that we have here. The one that was supplied with the kit was actually very nicely done, but regrettably during construction, the piece flung off my tweezer and landed with the visor and lost partia. So unfortunately that piece had to be omitted from this build, which is not necessarily a problem as this component was removable. Now if the original piece ever turns up, or if I ever build another German assault gun that has this component on hand, I can make a copy or a mold of it and add that rest and casting completing the detail that we have here. But this would be something of course to be discussed and added in a, another future update or another showcase video for that other model. Moving from the roof now takes us again to the rear cleaning staves. These are again kit supplied and one feature that I did was that I painted the tips on either side with a swipe of brass paint as like I often mention on very commonly found on these German tanks the fittings for these components were made of brass and with a simple brush of brass or gold colored paint definitely gives the piece that little bit of kick and is definitely one that's appreciated once everything is said and done. Moving our way forward takes us to the model's muzzle brake. Now the muzzle brake on this kit here is supplied with an option between this version which is similar in design to that of the 88mm from the Tiger 1 or the other pattern is more cylindrical in shape and that version, again, is just another option left for the builder. The only differences between the two is really that with the cylindrical version, this does change the, some of the markings that can be applied to the model, which I'll be going over in a second. From the muzzle brake now takes us to the paint and the markings. Now because this particular vehicle was only present for the very early portion of the war, you are very limited with the amount of color schemes that can be applied to this vehicle. For this vehicle here you have the options of painting the vehicle with all panzer gray or all panzer gray. 
Now for this particular build, I want to step outside of the box when it comes to the type of paint that I use to paint the vehicle. For this tank, I wanted to try a darker shade of Panzer Grey compared to the other standard Panzer Grey that I've used on my other builds. Because of this, the vehicle is a lot darker compared to the other vehicles that I've built before. And it's definitely one that is more appreciated specifically when put in the collection and pretty much most of my other Panzer Grey tanks tend to follow similar guidelines. Now as for the markings, because there are only a very few of the real Dicker Max vehicles that have been produced and fielded, you're going to be extremely limited with the amount of units and battles that can be represented for this vehicle. Now, the Dragon Kit does supply you with a very good decal sheet, which supplies you everything from the units, as well as also the German crosses, and as well as the other markings which would be needed to build the vehicle. In addition to that, several kill rings are also included for that of the gun barrel. Now, the markings themselves that are supplied with the kit are very nicely done, which is typical in part and parcel for Dragon Kits as a whole. However, I did have a snafu when it came time to working with these decals. While I was experimenting with some other weathering techniques on this vehicle, the decals had a bad reaction to that of the weathering agent that I was using. And the reason of which was because the decals already had a clear lacquer painted on them and the agent reacted to the lacquer. Regrettably, this caused the decals to be ruined, and I had to basically rip them off. Now, one silver lining is that, for some weird reason, Dragon supplies you with more than enough decals for that of the unit marks, which are on the front, and the two sides here of the casemate. So replacing those markings were not an issue. However, the crosses that are supplied with the vehicle were not able to be salvaged, and new ones had to have been have been scrounged. The crosses that you see on this vehicle here were scrounged from my spare parts bin and I believe they're from the old Tallery Elephant that somehow I had old decals running around. The decals were basically the same size as the ones on the Dragon. The only difference is that the Dragon crosses are actually ghosted while these ones here have the black centers. The decals were simply just dropped in in place and the decals from the elephant from Italia are actually pretty decent in quality and basically are the same quality as the ones found on the Dragon Dicker Max. Now as for the kill rings, these were also not salvaged so rather than trying to come up or ignore the kill rings altogether I went ahead and painted the kill rings on via a paintbrush. Now at the time the barrel was not glued onto the vehicle and so this made painting of the kill stripes actually very easy. What I simply did was I took the barrel, put it in my machine lathe, and with a small paintbrush I turned on the lathe and just added the kill rings in the appropriate locations. With the kill rings added in paint, this makes them impervious for that of any sort of weathering agents that can be added. Same can also be said for the small little white dot that we have here in the front. The white dot is supplied with a decal, however, it's literally just a white dot and adding it via, with paint as opposed to a decal just simplifies weathering in a little bit of a manner. As for skill level and recommendation, due to the small sub-assemblies required to assemble all of the suspension components, as well as the gun, the gun carriage, and even with the way the casemate and upper hull need to fit together, something like this is definitely not recommended for that of a novice beginner. This kit here would be best suited for someone who has tackled a few builds under their belt and are looking to level up to something else. Something like this is best suited for that of a mid-level builder all the way up to a high-level builder. Of course, one modification that I cannot recommend enough is to replace the kit-supplied individual Lincoln Link tracks with a set of workable track links from an aftermarket source. The aftermarket tracks make the model easier to put together. It also, in my opinion, makes for a more enjoyable build. Also, once everything is completed, it just lends itself for a better build all throughout. This model here I recommend for anyone who's a fan of World War II German armor, also World War II tanks in general. 
this model here would easily fit into anyone who has a collection of early World War II German tanks, such as the Panzer II, the early Panzer IV, and of course probably like a Bison. In addition to that, this model would also fit in a collection of anyone who builds primarily limited production or prototype test vehicles, such as the Sturher Emil, or even the T-28 Super Heavy Tank, as well as the Taurus. This vehicle will easily fit into that collection without anyone batting an eye. The model's subject matter is also very interesting in that it is such a unique vehicle and is definitely one off of the beaded path. Something like this will definitely spice up anyone's tank collection. As for the build itself, I'm very happy on how everything turned out. The model went together in a fairly smooth manner with of course the exception of the binoculars and the visor that I of course mentioned before. As for the instructions, I didn't really see any typos or errors that are typically found on some other Dragon instructions on builds I've done in the past. And as for how the fit of all the plastic parts go together, again, the model went together in a really smooth manner. This, which is of course, which one would expect from a plastic Dragon kit of the modern era. Another area where I'm happy on how the build turned out is with that of the paint scheme. Like I said before, this model I was experimenting with a different shade of early war German Panzer Grey compared to the other builds that I've done for my collection as well as also for commission. After some of the techniques that I learned on this build here, I'm definitely going to start incorporating them into several other early war builds that I have in the pipeline. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale German Dicker Max. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook where there are more photographs of this particular model that have been posted, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on the ECA channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detailed components. Thanks for watching.